30th today. I and my son were engaged to dine at Mr. Balcombe's at the Briars. About half past three, I went to receive the Emperor's commands. He was the same as yesterday and did not intend to go out. Just before I reached Hut's Gate, the residence of Madame Bertrand, I met the governor on his way to Longwood. He asked me how the Emperor was. I told him I felt uneasy about him and that he had not seen any of us yesterday. I added that though he had told me this morning he was well, yet from his countenance, I should have expected a different account. About half past nine, we set out from the Briars on our return from Longwood. It was very dark. A heavy fall of rain had come on, which was as sharp and cutting as hail. We had a most disagreeable, troublesome, and dangerous ride, being every moment on the point of being precipitated into some abyss or other, for we were obliged to gallop on at random without seeing where we were going. We arrived at Longwood, drenched to the skin. The emperor had given orders that I should attend him on my return. He was well, but he had stayed at home as he had done yesterday. He said he'd been waiting for me and had many things to tell me. On learning that the governor had arrived, he admitted him into his chamber, though he was not dressed and was unable to rise from his couch. He said that he discussed with him in perfect composure all the points which naturally presented themselves to his mind. He spoke of protesting against the treaty of the 2nd of August, in which the Allied sovereigns declared him an exile and a prisoner. He asked what right these sovereigns had to dispose of him without his consent. Him who was their equal and had sometimes been their master. He said if he had thought proper to withdraw to Russia, Alexander, who styled himself his friend and who never had any but political disputes with him, would, if he had not, upheld him as a king. At least have treated him as one. This the governor could not deny. He said, had he thought proper to take refuge in Austria... The Emperor Francis could not, without disgracing himself, have denied him not only his empire, but even his house and his family, of which Napoleon was a member. This the governor also admitted. Lastly, said the Emperor, if relying on my own individual interests, I had persisted in defending them in France by force of arms. There is no doubt that the Allies would have formerly granted me immense advantages, perhaps even dominion. The governor, who hesitated for some time on this point, at length agreed that there was no doubt but the emperor might with ease have obtained a sovereignty. I do not wish it continued the emperor. I determined on abandoning public affairs, indignant at beholding the leading men in France betraying their country, or at least committing the grossest errors with regard to her interests, indignant at finding that the mass of the representatives preferred disgrace to death and stooped to barter with that sacred independence, which, like honor, should be a rocky and inaccessible island in this state of things. What did I determine on? What resolution did I adopt? I sought an asylum in a country which was supposed to be governed by laws among a people of whom for 20 years I had been the bitterest enemy. But what did you do? Your conduct will be recorded in history to your eternal disgrace. Yet there is an avenging providence. Sooner or later you will meet your reward. It will not be long before your prosperity, your laws will expiate your crime. Your ministers have sufficiently proved by their instructions that they wish to get rid of me. Why did not the king who prescribed me openly decree my death? One act would have been as legal as the other. A speedy termination of my sufferings would have shown more energy than the lingering death to which they have doomed me. The Calabrians have been more humane, more generous than the Allied Sovereigns or your ministers. I will not die by my own hands. That would be an act of cowardice to overcome misfortune is a proof of a noble and courageous mind. We mortals are bound to fulfill our destinies, but if it be intended to keep me here... I feel that you would be doing me a kindness and depriving me of life, for here I daily suffer the agonies of death. The limits of St. Helena are too narrow for me, who was every day accustomed to ride 10, 15, or 20 leagues on horseback. The climate is not like ours. Neither the sun nor the seasons are like what we have been accustomed to. Everything here is hostile to happiness and comfort. The situation is disagreeable and unwholesome. 
and it's destitute of water. This part of the island is totally barren and has been deserted by the inhabitants. The governor stated that his instructions required that the emperor should be restricted to certain limits on his rides and that an officer should always accompany him. If they had been thus observed, replied the emperor, I should never have left my chamber. If your instructions will not admit of greater latitude, you can henceforth do nothing for us. However, I neither ask nor wish for anything. Convey these sentiments to the English government. This said the emperor is a consequence of transmitting instructions from so great a distance and with regard to a person of whom those who draw up the instructions know so little. He then endeavored to shift the question by intimating that on the arrival of the wooden house or palace, which was on its way to St. Helena, better plans might be adopted that the vessel which was expected was bringing furniture and stores of provisions, which it was supposed would be agreeable to the emperor that the English government was exerting every effort to alleviate his situation. The emperor replied that all their efforts amounted to little, that he had requested to be furnished with the Morning Chronicle and the Statesman, that he might read what related to himself under the least disagreeable forms, but his request had never been complied with. He had asked for books which were his only consolation, but nine months had passed away, and he had not received any. He had desired to obtain intelligence of his wife and son, but this had been withheld from him as to the provisions of furniture and the house that are intended for me continued he you and i sir are soldiers we know how to value these things you have been in my native city perhaps in the very house occupied by my family though it was not the worst on the island though i have no reason to be ashamed of my family's circumstances yet you know what they were but Though I have occupied a throne and have disposed of crowds, I have not forgotten my first condition. My couch and my camp bed, you see, are still sufficient for me. The governor observed that the wooden palace and its accompaniments were at least not to be disregarded. Probably not, replied the emperor, for your own satisfaction in the eyes of Europe. But to me, they are matters of perfect indifference. It is not a house, not furniture that should have been sent to me, but... An executioner in a coffin, the former are a mockery, and the latter would be a favor. I say again, the instructions your ministers tend to this result, and I invoke it. The admiral, who is not an ill-disposed man, appeared to me now to have softened these instructions. I do not complain of his acts. His forms alone offended me. Here the governor asked whether he had unconsciously committed any faults. No, sir, we complain of nothing since your arrival, yet one act has offended us. That is your inspection of our domestics. It was insulting to Monsieur de Montsalon by appearing to throw a suspicion on his integrity, and it was petty, disagreeable, and insulting towards me, and perhaps degrading to the English general himself, who thus came to interfere between me and my valet de chambre. The governor was seated in an armchair on one side, the emperor who had remained stretched on his couch. It was dark. The evening was drawing in, and it was not easy to distinguish objects. Therefore, observed the emperor, it was in vain that I endeavored to watch the play of his features and to observe the impression which my words made on him. In course of the conversation, the emperor, who in the morning had been reading the campaign of 1814 by Alphonse de Beauchamp, in which all the English bulletins bore the signature low. Asked the governor if he was the individual who had signed them. Sir Hudson, though, with marked embarrassment, replied in the affirmative and added that the bulletins represented his views and opinions. The governor, who had several times proposed that the emperor should be attended by his physician, who he said was a very skillful man on taking his leave again and proposed to send his doctor to Longwood. But the emperor saw his motives and constantly resisted his offer. Having res related all these particulars to me, the emperor remained silent for some minutes. Then resuming apparently... After some reflection, he said, How mean and disagreeable is the expression of the governor's countenance. I never saw anything like it in my life. I should be unable to drink my coffee if this man were besides me. My dearest causes, they have set me worse than a jailer. I shall insert here three additional chapters on the campaign of Italy. The first describes a campaign of 26 days for the grand events crowned by the battle of Castiglione, which title it bears. The second and third chapters entitled Arcola and Rivoli detail a series of new prodigies. The battle of Castiglione. One, March of Wurmser quits the command of the army of Germany and takes that of the Austrian army of 
Italy, the army of Italy, had opened the campaign in the month of April. June had arrived, and the armies of the north of the Rhine and the Sambre and Musa were still in active. These great and excellent armies, containing more than 200,000 men, constituting the principal forces of the Republic, were quietly doing garrison duty in Holland, on the Musa, and Rhine and in the Alsace. When the arrival of the French on the Adige and the blockade of Mantua became known, the court of Austria gave up the plan of offensive operations in Alsace and on the Lower Rhine, which it had projected and ordered Marshal Wurzer, who had been destined for these operations to come back with all possible expedition for the purpose of conducting affairs in Italy, and to bring thither the 30,000 of his best troops, which added to the reinforcements sent from every part of the monarchy, would make up an army of near 100,000 men. The French army of Italy had accomplished its task in destroying the army opposed to it. If the armies of the north had done as much, the contest would have been over. Reports of the preparation making by the House of Austria were heard. However, throughout Italy, all the confidential intelligence of the diplomatic agents, all the letters of the enemies of France were filled with particulars of the immense means which were about to be brought into action and of the certainty that before the end of August, the Emperor of Germany would be master of Milan and would have driven the French out of Italy. Two, situation of the army of Italy from the end of June. The French general had been attentively considering all these preparations and was greatly alarmed at them. He had made the directory sensible that it was impossible for his 30,000 French to sustain alone the efforts of the whole power of Austria. He demanded either that reinforcements should be sent to him from the armies of the Rhine or that those armies themselves should begin the campaign without delay. He reminded them of the positive promise which he had received on leaving Paris. That these armies should commence operations on the 15th of April. He complained that two months had elapsed without their having stirred. Worms, sir marched from the Rhine with his reinforcements towards the beginning of June and towards the end of the same months. The army of the Rhine and the Sabre and Musa at length opened the campaign, but their diversion was no longer serviceable to the army of Italy, Vermser, having already reached it. The French general joined all his forces on the Adige and de Chiesa. He left no troops in the legations or in Tuscany except one battalion of depot in the citadel of Ferrara. And two in Leghorn, he reduced as much as possible to the garrisons of Coney, Tortona, and Alessandria. He collected and brought within his own disposal all the disposable resources of the army. The siege of Mantua began to produce sickness, and notwithstanding all the care that could be taken to expose as few men as possible before that unwholesome place, our losses became very considerable. The general-in-chief could not assemble more than 30,000 effective men under arms. It was with this army that he was shortly to oppose the principal army, the House of Austria. The correspondence of the different countries of Italy with the Tyrol was very active. In that province, we were collected all the hostile forces. It was easy to perceive the daily increasing evil influence of all these preparations on the popular mind. The partisans of the French tremble. Those of Austria, on the contrary, assumed a proud and threatening tone, but all were astonished that a power like France should leave an army which had to serve so well of its country without succor or support. These remarks found their way to the soldiery by means of their habitual communications with the inhabitants of the country. At the end of July, General Surrey's headquarters were at Salo. He was ordered to cover the debauch of the Chiesa, where a great road passes that leads from Trent to Brescia. Messina was at Busolengo, causing Corona and Montebaldo to be occupied by Joubert's brigade and encamping with the rest of his division. On the level of Rivoli, Dallomini's brigade was posted in Verona. Ogaro's division occupied Porto Legnano and the lower Adige. General Guillaume commanded at Peschiera with six galleys under the command of Captain Lalomon of the Navy secured the Lake of Garda. Lastly, Surrier was pressing the siege of Mantua and Kilmaine commanded the cavalry of the army. Three, Vermser's plan of campaign. Vermser had the choice of two plans, either to pass the Brenta and to debauch by Vicenza and Padua on the Adige, by which route he would have avoided the mountains, but would have found himself separated from Mantua by the Adige and obliged to force the passage of that river in the face of the French army, or to debauch 
between Adige and the Lake of Garda take possession of Montebaldo. And the level of Rivoli bring up his artillery and baggage by the road which runs parallel with the left bank of the Adige. His army would then have cleared the mountains and the Adige and would have no obstacle remaining in the way of his arrival at Mantua. But his artillery and cavalry would not be able to join his infantry until he should take the level of Rivoli. Thus, he might find himself attacked and obliged to fight a device of battle before he could be joined by his artillery and cavalry. Firmser, however, disregarded this objection and adopted the plan last described when informed of the taking of the entrenched camp of Mantua and the hazardous situation of the fortress itself. He hastened his movements by eight or ten days. He divided his army to three corps. The first and most considerable, forming his center, devoured by Montebaldo and occupied all the country between the Adige and the Lake of Garda. It was composed of four divisions containing 40,000 men. The second forming his left, composed of a division of infantry of 10 or 12,000 men, with all the artillery, cavalry, and baggage, took the road leading from Roveredo to Verona, passing along the left bank of the Adige, and was to join the army by passing the Adige either at the level of Rivoli or over the bridges at Verona. The third corps, composing his right and consisting of three divisions, containing from 30 to 35,000 men, directed its course to the left bank of the Lake of Garda, followed the course of the Chiesa, coasting the Lake of Idro. By marching in this direction, this corps was to turn the Mincio, cut off one of the great roads of the French army to Milan, and turn the whole siege of Mantua. This plan was, on the part of the enemy, the result of an extreme confidence in their own force and expected successes. They were so certain of defeating us that they were already contriving how to cut us off from all means of retreat. Thus, Wormser was, in perspective, surrounding the whole French army by anticipation, conceiving that army to be so completely chained down to the defense of Mantua that to surround that fixed point was to surround the army, which he regarded as inseparable from the siege for Vermser debouches by the Montebaldo, by the road by Roveredo to Verona, and by that of the Chiesa on the 29th of July. At the end of July, the headquarters of the French army were removed to Brescia on the 28th. At 10 in the evening, the French general set out from Brescia to visit his advance posts. Having reached Peschiera at daybreak on the 29th, he there learned that Corona and Montebaldo were attacked by considerable forces. At 8 o'clock in the morning, he arrived at Verona. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the enemy's light troops appeared on the tops of the mountains, which divide Verona from the Tyrol, and engaged with our troops. The general-in-chief retired during the whole of the evening and fixed his headquarters at Castle Nuevo between the Dij and the Mincio, where he was better able to receive their ports of the whole line. In the course of the night, he learned that Joubert, having been attacked by Corona by a whole army, had resisted during the whole day, but had subsequently fallen back on the level of Rivoli, which was occupied by Messina in great strength. That numerous lines of fires covered all the mountains between the Lake of Garda and the Adige, that on the heights of Verona, the fires gave reason to believe that towards the evening, the enemy's troops had increased in that quarter, that on the side of Montebello, Vicenza, Bassano, and Lignano, there were neither movements nor enemy, but that on the side of Brescia, three hostile divisions had debouched by the Valley of Chiesa. One covered the heights of St. Osseto appearing to be directed on Brescia. Another had taken up a position at Gavardo and seemed directed on Ponte Marco and Lenato. The third had made for Salo, where the contest had already begun. A little after, he was informed that the St. Zetto division of the enemy had already advanced its van to Brescia, where it had met with no resistance, since only 300 convalescents had been left there to guard the hospitals. Thus, the communication of the army with Milan by Brescia being interrupted. We could now communicate with that city only by way of Cremona. Light horsemen belonging to the enemy appeared on all the roads leading from Brescia to Milan, Cremona, and Mantua, announcing everywhere that an army of 80,000 men had to bouch by Brescia, whilst another 100,000 men was bouching by Verona. Napoleon also learned that the division of the enemy directed on Salo had come to action with Surrey, who having gained intelligence, the other two divisions 
which were advancing towards Brescia and Lonato, had been apprehensive of being cut off from Brescia and the army, and had thought it expedient to fall back on the heights of Disenzano in order to keep up his communications that he had left General Gaiu at Salo with 1,500 men in an ancient castle, a kind of fortress secure from any sudden assault that the enemy's division of Gavardo had advanced some light horse on Ponte San Marco, but that they had been held in check by a company of light infantry posted there. Five, grand and prompt resolution taken by the French general, action of Salo, action of Lenato. 31st of July, Grimsor's plan of attack was now discovered. The French army alone opposed to all these forces could do nothing, but opposed to each of them separately. It would be on an equality. The French general instantly formed his determination. The enemy had taken the lead in moving, which he hoped to preserve. The French general resolved to disconcert his plans by taking the lead himself. Firm, sir, suppose the French army fixed to the position of Mantua. Napoleon instantly resolved to make the army movable by raising the siege of that place, sacrificing his battering train and rapidly advancing on one of these corps with the whole collective strength of his army in order to return successfully to attack each of the other corps, the right of the Austrian army, which had debouched by the Chiesa and Brescia Road, being the most advanced, he advanced against it first. Surrier burnt his carriages and his platforms, threw his powder into the water, buried his shot, spiked his guns, and raised the siege of Mantua in the night of the 31st of July. Ogaro marched from Lignano to Burghetto on the Mincio. Throughout the 30th, Messina defended the heights between the Adige and the Lake of Garda. Dalabania marched on Lonato. The general-in-chief ascended the heights in the rear of Densenzano. He made Sire march back to Cello to extricate General Caillou, who was compromised in the bad position in which Sire had left him. Ne nevertheless, the general had withstood a whole division of the enemy for 48 hours. Five times he attacked him by assault. Five times they had attacked him by assault. And five times he had strewn the avenues with their dead. Sire came up at the very moment when the enemy was making a last effort. He fell on their flanks, defeated them entirely, and took some colors and disengaged Guillaume. At the same time, the Austrian divisions of Cavardo had marched on Lunata to take up a position on the heights and endeavor to effect a junction with Wurmser on the Mincio. The general in chief himself led Dalamania's brigade against that division. This brigade performed prodigies of valor. The 32nd formed part of it. The enemy was defeated, put to flight, and suffered great loss. Those two divisions of the enemy, beating by Sire and Dalamania, rallied in Cavardo. Sire. Fearful of compromising himself, returned and took up an intermediate position between Cello and Denzanzano. In the meantime, Vermser had caused his artillery and cavalry to pass the bridges of Verona, being master of all the country between the Adige and the Lake of Garda. He posted one of his divisions on the heights of Peschiera to mass that place to keep up his communications. He directed two others with part of his cavalry on Brigetto to gain possession of the bridges over the Mincio, and to debouch on the Chiesa in order to place himself in communication with his right. Lastly, with his two last divisions of infantry and the rest of his cavalry, he marched on Mantua to oblige the French to raise the siege of that place. Twenty-four hours had elapsed since the French troops had evacuated all their positions before Mantua. Vermser found that trenches and batteries were still complete. The guns dismounted and spiked, and the wrecks of carriages platforms and stores of all kinds strewn about in every direction. The precipitancy with which these measures seem to have been affected must have delighted him extremely. All that he saw around him appeared much more like the result of panic terror than of a deliberate plan. Messina, after having held the enemy in check throughout the 30th pass of Mincio at Peschiera in the night, and continued his march on Russia. The Austrian division, which appeared before Peschiera, found the right bank of the Mincio line of scourgers furnished by the garrison and by a rear guard left by Messina, which had orders to dispute the passage of Mincio and a rally at Donato when the passage should be forced. Augaro in marching on Brescia had passed Mincio at Borghetto. He had cut down the bridge and likewise left the rear guard to line the river with orders to rally at Castiglione when it should be forced. The general-in-chief marched all the night of the 31st July with Augaro 
and Vesalius divisions on Russia, where they arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning, the division of the enemy of Russia, learning that the whole of the French army was debouching upon them by all the roads, took good care not to wait for it, and fell back precipitately. When the Austrians entered Russia, they found all their sick and convalescents there. But their stay was so short that their departure so hasty that they had not time to reconnoiter or dispose of their prisoners. General Lespinois and Adjutant General Herbin, with several battalions each, were sent in pursuit of the enemy towards St. Osseto and the debauches of the Chiesa. The two divisions of Ogaro and Messina returned by a rapid countermarch on the side of the Mincio. Whence they had proceeded to support the rear guard. Six battled Lenato, August 3rd. On the 2nd of August, Ogaro, whose division formed the right, occupied Montechiero. Messina's division forming the center was encamped at Ponte Marco, connected with that of Survey, which forming the left occupied an eminence between Salo and Tenzanzano, facing to the rear in order to check the whole of the army's right. In the meantime, the rear guard, which Ogaro and Messina had left on the Mincio, had retired before the divisions of the enemy, which had passed that river, that of Ogaro, which had orders to join at Castiglione, quitted its post too soon, and returned in disorder to join its corps. Napoleon, dissatisfied with General Vallette, who commanded it, cashiered him before the troops for not having evinced more firmness on this occasion. As for General Pigeon, who commanded Messina's rear guard, he returned in good order on Lunato, according to his instructions, and there established himself. The enemy, taking advantage of General Vallette's error, took possession of Castiglione on the 2nd and entrenched themselves there. On the 3rd, the Battle of Lunato took place on the part of the enemy firms, just two divisions from Bergato and one brigade of the division, which had remained at Pesci era, were engaged, forming a total of about 30,000 men. The French had from twenty to 23,000, and their success was not doubtful. Firm, sir, with the two divisions of infantry and the cavalry, which he had taken to Mantua, could not be present at this action at the dawn of the day. The enemy advanced on Lunato, which place they attacked briskly. By this point, they intended to form their junction with their right, respecting which they now began to entertain apprehensions. Messina's vanguard was overthrown. The enemy took Lunato, the general-in-chief who was at Ponte Marco, marched in person to retake Lunato. The Austrian general Zion, having extended too far, still with the intention of gaining on his right in order to open his communications with Sello, was penetrated Lunato, taken at the charge. And the enemy Zion intersected. Part of their force fell back on the Mincio, the remainder on Salo. But the latter were met by General Surrey in front and had General Hilaire in rear turned on every side. And they were obliged to lay down arms. Although we sustained an attack in the center, we were the assailants on the right. As soon as it was day, Ogaro attacked the enemies who covered Castiglione and broke them after an obstinate engagement in which the valor of the troops made up for their deficiency in numbers. The enemy suffered great loss. Castiglione was taken from them, and they retired on Mantua once the first reinforcements came, but not until the action was over. We lost many brave men in this desperate affair. The army regretted, in particular, General Biron and Cap Colonel Poulier, very distinguished officers. The eighth surrender of the three divisions of the enemy's right and part of their center, the three divisions of the right of the enemy's army, received intelligence to the Battle of Lenato during the night. They already heard the cannon, and they became extremely disheartened. This junction with the principal corps of the army was now become impossible. They had, moreover, seen several French divisions near them, which they supposed to be still maneuvering against them. The French army seemed to them innumerable. They beheld it in every direction. Firm, sir, had detached a part of his troops from Mantua towards Marcaria in pursuit of Surya. He was obliged to lose some time in effecting the return of these troops on Castiglione on the 4th. He was not ready for action. He employed the whole day in reassembling his troops, reorganizing those which had fought at Lenato, and supplying his artillery with fresh doors when the French general went about 2 or 3 in the afternoon to reconnoiter this line of the battle. He found it formidable and still 
just added 40,000 fighting men. He gave orders to introduce added trench in Castiglione and set out himself for Leonardo in order to superintend in person the movement of his troops, which became of uh, the highest importance to him to collect during the night about Castiglione. Throughout the day, Saray and her band on one side and Dalamani and St. Hilaire on the other had followed the march of the three divisions of the enemy's right and of those cut off from the center on the day of the Battle of Lenato, pursuing them as closely as possible and making prisoners at every step. Whole battalions had laid down arms at St. Ozeto, others at Gavardo, and others were wandering about in perplexity in the neighboring rallies. Four or five thousand of the latter were informed by the peasants that there were not above 1,200 French in Lenata. They marched thither in hope of opening a passage towards Invincio. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. Napoleon on his side was entering the town. Coming from Castiglione, a flag of truce was announced to him. And whilst the troops were getting under arms, he learned that the columns of the enemy were debouching by Ponte St. Marco. And that they intended entering Lenato and had summoned that town to surrender. We were, however... Masters of Cello and Gavardo, it was therefore evident that those could only be straggling columns trying to open themselves a passage. Napoleon ordered his numerous staff to mount their horses. He then had the officer who came to parley brought before him and caused the bandage to be taken from his eyes in the midst of all the bustle of the headquarters of the commander-in-chief. Go tell your general, said he, that I give him eight minutes to lay down arms. He is in the midst of the French army. After the expiration of that time, no hope remains for him. These four or five thousand men who had been harassed for three days, wandering in uncertainty, not knowing what was to become of them, and the persuasion that they had been deceived by the peasants, laid down their arms. This circumstance alone may convey an idea of the disorder and confusion of these Austrian divisions, which after being beaten at Salo, Lenato, Cavardo, and pursued in every direction, were already most disorganized. All the rest of the fourth and the whole of the night were passed in rallying all the columns, concentrating them at Castiglione.